Uh, I know, I'm, Lori, I'll come to you in just one second, Tim. Eric, um, the way I'm starting to look at this, and I'm seeing three or four major factors that are at play here. It isn't, we're talking about there's some, some legal and constitutional issues, right? None of us at this table, despite that many of us are, are, are attorneys by background, have the expertise in constitutional law to make a complete determination whether or not this is going to be legal or illegal. So you have constitutional issues at play. We know in the process already private level security investors and investors in RMBS securities have been hurt by the diminution in, in housing values around the country. Right? That's a given. So, and we're looking to, to uh, at a hostile action that would take additionally from savers, investors who have been providing liquidity. Remember, the calculus, part of their, their evaluation when they invest in that type of securities is a public purpose and a public good. They're trying to be a good public citizen to provide capital for homeowners to help grow community. So those people are being hurt again additionally. Are we going to see them investing with MRP? Ask them. Um, and thirdly, it's, it's the economic impact of these actions on the market itself, is it not? So we're talking about what happens to capital. Does capital stay there? Do they come back to an area where they have to factor in? Remember, investors, on behalf of the fiduciary duty for, for Main Street investors, are looking at, at an interest rate risk, at credit risk, a reinvestment risk, things of that nature. They've never factored in. Ever before have they ever factored in the fact that someone may use eminent domain and take an asset from them. That's not factored into the equation. So are you going to go back and stand in front of the firing squad where they pick your pocket and say, I'm going to continue to lend it? And this is just common sense. This is not threats about anybody. This is investors' willingness to provide capital. If the risk is too great to the extent that you bruise or, or harm parties to a contract, we live in a country where contract law is vitally important. We chided emerging markets for years about protecting the right of investors who come in with capital. Look what Argentina happened in this country but when they defaulted on the debt in 2002. Have they been back to be able to raise money in this, this market again? No, they haven't. Investors disappear. They have their risk averse. Why are they risk averse? Because they represent the interest of Main Street investors, and in doing so, they have a fiduciary obligation. If they don't, they are liable for the loss of the value of those assets. It's not going to happen. This is a practical consideration. And common sense will tell you investors will disappear, liquidity drives up in that community, and what happens to the value of the homes when liquidity and interest rates go up? Go up? Liquidity drives up and interest rates. Lori? Yeah, I was actually going to make um, two points. The first was the point you made, which I just think is absolutely critical. The, what we all want at the end of the day is a housing recovery because a rising, a t rising tide lifts all boats. Those underwater borrowers will not be underwater if their home price increases. What is the key to widespread increases in home prices? It's credit availability. It's making sure that someone who wants to buy a home, who has some down payment to put down, can do so. The question is, how much of a down payment? Well, if you're going to start seizing these underwater mortgages, you are going to completely dry up the market for these higher LTV loans. And I think that's absolutely critical. So basically, so um, you're crimping credit availability going um, forward in such a way that you're impeding a what could be a housing recovery. Lori, can, can I just interrupt for just one yeah. second? It was a point that occurred to me. I think it would help the audience to understand. When you say impeding the market for these high LTV loans, we're talking about a secondary market, right? There is no new market for high LTV private little securities. Um, well, there is no new market for, um, for high LTV um, private label securities, that is absolutely. I mean, However, let me make, let me make, sure. let me, which goes to my second point, and that is, um, let, let's assume that fair market value is being paid for these loans. Um, I would actually, um, we've read a lot of PSAs, and I can assure you the trustee has no, no general fiduciary responsibility with respect to eminent domain, and has, has very, you know, so I can, so that, but you know, the question is, why could this not be extended to GSE loans? And if once it's implemented for private label securities, it could easily be implemented for GSE loans, and you know, people are going to, you know, and that's going to be priced for. Bank portfolios are going to be more reluctant to lend because, again, if it happened to private label securities, why could it not happen to these other things? And um, you know, fair market value is really being paid. You know, there's no reason why it 
you know, there's no, there's no argument for not pursuing these other products. So I think, you know, once you begin to set the precedent, people assume it's going to be implemented in a far broader fashion, and you're going to totally choke off the market. I, 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 I just, if I may, I want to send it back to Sipma for just one second, because, and play the devil's advocate here, I definitely do not have a dog in the hunt, but if we talk about liquidity provision, the investors whom you're referring to provided liquidity. They created the opportunity for these homes to be sold and financed, but they're not providing liquidity today to this market, are they? I mean, they're not, again, I mean, if there were demand, but I'm just, just again, making the point, if there were demand for uh, low FICO, high LTV loans, then the private level securitization market would presumably be securitizing these loans and selling them to the same investors, would they not? The, the issue as to liquidity today is the presence or the absence of a government guarantee. The government guaranteed market consisting of Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA, Ginny Mae as a partnership is about 97% of the mortgage market in the United States. As public policy, that is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But as investment reality, that's just the truth of it, based on a concept, based on a sense of no trust in almost any aspect uh, of the private labor market. So there, there, there really is no market but for uh, held portfolios on the part of banks uh, who are making larger loans and keeping them, uh, not securitizing them, because there is no broad market. Uh, for, for those loans. I mean, I think a, a simple way of phrasing what Richard is getting at is that the government is underpricing creditors right now. It's exactly what I think the director of Marco came out with last week in saying that we have to increase the GP. And he increased it and is moving to increase it by 10 basis points. I'd say most people in the secondary market would say that that increase has to be of the magnitude of something like 50 basis points to get the government guarantee priced efficiently vis-a-vis -vis the market. The reason you don't see private capital coming into the market is effectively the government is giving underpriced capital out. And you can argue with FHA loans and a declining home price market originating a 97.75 um, loan at that LTV level. And then you layer on the risk of eminent domain potentially coming back on those loans. That, I think, if you think about the biggest risk factor for eminent domain, it's not necessarily the private label securities. It's the FHA program that has the most number of underwater borrowers out there. Uh, Bob, I just we haven't heard from Neela in some time. Uh, she's the economist on the panel, and that she, she, she indicated that she'd like to add something. Actually, I've already lost her. I'd be on the panel. A um, couple of things. Uh, first of all, TARP money that was intended to solve the housing crisis, about 10% of that has been spent. The hardest hit fund that was targeted towards states like California that had uh, uh, house prices soar and high unemployment rates, only about 3% of those funds have been used. There are obstacles to solving this issue. And though there is a lot of disagreement on the way to solve the issue, there's been some general consensus both at FHFA, uh, to Lori Goodman, to, to a lot of investors that targeted principal reduction makes sense. So how do you target it? A lot of people say, let's do it through Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. The problem with instituting targeted principal reduction through these agencies is whatever they come up with has to be universal. It has to be universally applied to all services. They are not in the position to target individual mortgages to finance or to modify. That's why San Bernardino County's attempt makes sense, because they're actually targeting individual mortgages out of pools. Why private label pools? Well, a lot of the mortgages originated in these pools were not available for purchase. Either the mortgages were too high, they were jumbo loans, and Freddie and Fannie couldn't purchase them, or they were subprime mortgages. Again, Freddie and Fannie couldn't purchase them, and so they ended up in private label securities. Now, the question of credit risks is also very important. Freddie, Fannie, and Jenny May are not the only entities underpricing credit risks. In fact, the whole reason for the housing boom and bust was the underpricing of credit risks. And so going back to that is a very important problem. And my question actually to Bob, because this is what I really don't understand, is what happens to these mortgages? Right now they're in private label securities, and in the absence of a federal guarantee in private label securities, you have 
over collateralization of those securities. You have tranching so that investors who are more willing to take risks are first in line to take that hit in case that happens. What happens to these mortgages pulled out of the pools? Are they kept on balance sheet? Are they kept as whole loans? Are they pulled? How are they structured? I think this is an important piece of, of the puzzle. And if there are very few mortgages, they have similar characteristics, like they're all based in San Bernardino County, then they're going to have a lot of risk. Because what happens when that, if that, God forbid, something happens within that county in terms of their economy, you don't have the geographical diversity to withstand that kind of credit risk. These are all issues that are still haven't been addressed. Last point, that does not mean something does not, cannot, and should not be done. Because this is an ongoing problem. It not only affects San Bernardino County, it affects the US economy. Housing is a significant headwind to the economy. Till we solve this problem, we're not gonna have the sustainable recovery that everybody wants. And so giving, again, local governments uh, an option for targeted principal reduction makes sense. And to me, this is a wake-up call. It's a wake-up call to the government, and it's a wake-up call to the investors on this panel. If you don't want counties doing this for yourself, you might want to think about a plan to organize yourselves to target these mortgages that would benefit from principal reduction going forward. Would, would, would the proposal, I'm, I'm interested to know from, from uh, Tom here, and Tim, and Richard, would the proposal be any more palatable uh, to you as representatives of investors, the people who bought the, you who bought the securities that hold the